Merrill Kelly was the pitcher nobody wanted. After years in Tampa Bay's minor league system, he was left off the roster and unprotected. Made available, every team passed. That meant going to the other side of the world to keep his career alive. Four successful seasons in Korea finally gave him his chance as a 30-year-old Diamondbacks rookie. But that summer, Merrill went two months without winning a game, and his manager told him that chance for which he'd worked his whole life and traveled the baseball globe, was slipping away. I will never forget this. I remember Tori looking at me in the face and saying that I was the worst statistical, as far as starting pitchers go, I was the worst statistical starting pitcher in the big league since the All-Star break. And that was, like I said, probably nine games after the break. So it'd been a, a decent stretch. We're not talking about, you know, three or four games here and then that's it. I remember that middle of August yep. that year and then everything turned. You had that last six weeks was really good. Yeah, yeah. So what, what changed? I think I just, my back was up against the wall. And I didn't. And you'd been there before over yeah. the course of your career. Yeah. And, you know, I'd like to think that I operate pretty well there and, you know, it worked out. Um, but I, like I said, I just didn't have a choice. It was either that or go back to the bullpen, which I had no interest in doing. Um, so at that point, I think that's probably when the confidence started to switch a little bit and when I started to get my feet underneath me because I didn't have a choice. It was either pitch better or go to the bullpen. And then after that, who knows what happens. So how do you respond when your manager tells you you're the worst pitcher starting pitcher in the major leagues um, like how do you react to that what what's I, I mean there's nothing I could really do to get mad about it because it was it was true you know it, it'd be, it, it was it would be one thing if you know he was just throwing that at me for no reason but right. the I mean the numbers backed it up I was pitching really really bad so once again like I said I, I just didn't really have a choice it was either pitch better or, or end up somewhere where I didn't want to be and I just made a choice to to pitch better, it, how, how does one do that? Let it fly. That? No, I think it was more mentality-wise than anything. Gotcha. You know, like you said, the nibbling and the and the lack of confidence and the body language and all that stuff. Once I heard that, it was like, all right, well, yeah. you have to toughen up. You have to get through this, or it's not going to end the way that you want it to. So I changed some things mechanically, uh, and that's kind of when everything turned around. There has to be a moment of nervousness, if not panic. I think everybody's been in that position in life where you get to where you've been trying to get to for so long and then suddenly it doesn't go real well right away. Yeah. Yeah, and that was I think that was probably rock bottom at that point. Cuz the beginning of the season in 19 was actually pretty good. Yeah. You know, I was holding my own. It wasn't anything spectacular, but it was definitely for for what the contract was and what they expected of me, I, I think I was doing a pretty good job of meeting those expectations. Yeah. So, you know, just sitting there climbing the rope and then, you know, you have that feeling of the ropes falling and you're trying to catch it as fast as you can and I think for those month that from that month and a half that was the feeling um, and then after that it was okay the rope has been tightened and now I can start climbing up again. Merrill Kelly outstanding. Now you're at a position where you couldn't be farther away from that yeah. where it seems like there are starts where you are just in that zone and you could put the ball any one of five pitches, anywhere you want, anytime. What's that feeling like? That feels more like myself, honestly. Um, you know, coming up in the minor leagues, I was never the guy that had the stuff, right? That was, that's how I survived, by making pitches, by locating, by mixing speeds and doing everything that I'm doing now, except now I'm probably doing it at a much higher level than I was back then. Um, so what I see on the mound and what you guys are seeing now in my mind is, is what I expect of myself. It's just taken me a little bit longer to get here than I would have liked. Everybody says that, right? I mean, everybody has a path. I mean, yeah. You're where you're supposed to be at all, you know, yeah, grow I would, where I would, you're planted, they say, I would, right? I would think so, yeah. I think this is definitely where my path has led me and I, I firmly believe that this is where I'm supposed to be. And that's part of the reason why I signed the extension in, in spring training because, you know, there's, uh, I started thinking about if I would want to play anywhere else or what that would look like and what life would look like now, especially that we have a, you know, a beautiful baby daughter um, and my wife and my family that's all here. Um, so all that came into consideration and being able to stay home, um, waking up in my own bed every day, you know, it's like, it, like I compare it to coming off the road, you know, we're about to go to Colorado and San Fran and when we get back, you know, I go home. 
a lot of these guys go back to their rental houses or their apartments or whatnot or um, that's a real luxury isn't it? and i get to go home yeah my yeah. dogs are there it's oh what kind of dogs uh we have two golden doodles oh okay. yeah um so it, it feels like home every time we get to come back i think which is one of the biggest perks does that help you feel more settled yeah. as, a, as a human being not a baseball player but yeah no doubt no doubt got to. yeah because we don't have you know, we don't have a mortgage and a rent somewhere else. We don't have to search for a place in spring training and then during the season. Um, we don't it's have to pack all. Great setup. Yeah, we don't have to pack everything up and ship it across the country, or my wife doesn't have to drive it across the country. You know, where we are for spring training is the same place that we are for season, which is the same place that we are for the whole year. You're in Tampa Bay's minor league system for a while. Suddenly you're not on the 40. Nothing in the rule five. Yeah. How do you decide where to go from there? How did that, that process happen? So 2014 was in Durham all season. Had the best year of my career at that point. Threw 120 innings, had a, I think like a 2-6 ERA. And that was my protection year. So I ended up going to the Dominican that year, uh, playing winter ball and the Korean team had come in August of that season asking me if I wanted to come for the rest of the year. Tampa threw up a big buyout, so the Koreans went away for a little while, and then the last week I was in uh, Santo Domingo, my agent called and said, hey, the Koreans are back, they wanna make this happen. So at the time, I had been a swing man the whole time, you know, kind of in and out of the rotation, which I didn't enjoy that role at all. In Durham? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, I mean, really just my whole time with Tampa. Um, if they needed somebody to start, I was that guy, but if they didn't need anybody, then I was in the pen. And you wanted to be a starter. Yeah, yeah. I knew I could, or at least I felt like I could, um, and that was where my heart was. I enjoyed being a, I enjoy being a starter. I like knowing what day I'm gonna pitch. I enjoy the routine. I enjoy everything about it. I'm not wired for, for the bullpen to sit around and wait for my name to be called. I don't, I don't handle that well. More routine oriented? Yeah, 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 I enjoy my routines big time. So I said, okay, um, if I don't get rule five, like you said, or if I don't get per protected, if I don't get put on the roster, then we'll go. And that day happened in the Dominican. Um, I remember there was a guy named Jet Bandy, a uh, catcher who I played oh, yeah. with, yeah, who actually got put on the roster that day. Brewers, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was super pumped for him, but I just remember being in the elevator, talking to him and, and congratulating him on being put on the roster. And in the back of my mind, I knew that uh, my life was about to change big time. What does that feel like? Uh, it was exciting, you know, it was scary, going to a country that I knew nothing about, because until 2014, I had no idea there was even a KBO. I knew people went to Japan, but I had no idea people went to Korea. So I had nothing to go off of. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. All I knew was I was trying to change my situation, which I had in Tampa, and you know, it worked out for the best. I remember hearing you do some interviews when you first got here or the year after your first year here where you, you were like, I wasn't sure my stuff would play at this level like it did in Korea. What was that adjustment like for you going through that? Well, like, okay, I'm finally here, I'm a 30 year old rookie and I can do this here. Yeah, I don't know if it was ever the question if the stuff played. I think when I got here, even though I was 30 years old, you know, I'd kind of been around the block a little bit. I think I still, I put the big leagues on such a pedestal. You know, like it's something that I've thought about since I was, you know, five years old in the backyard. So I think when I finally got here, I still, you know, I still looked at it as the bright lighted big leagues. Um, sure. You know, I looked at the guys in the clubhouse as, the big leaguers and that I was you know in the locker room with the big leaguers I think it was more of kind of a confidence thing in myself to consider myself a big leaguer and not just be among the big leaguers um, so I, I don't think it was ever a question of stuff I think it was more of just a question of like you said do I belong here you don't want to be the guy from Korea yeah, you know, I didn't want to be the guy coming in like, all right, who's this guy we got from Korea? He's never been in the big leagues. Can he handle it? There was just a lot of, there's a lot of noise, a lot of questions in my head that looking back on it now, um, you know, I wish I could have gotten those thoughts out of my head a lot quicker than I did. 
you know, obviously my journey has led me, this is my fourth year, which I'm extremely grateful for. You know, I have a new extension, which I'm extremely grateful for. But I think as far as just numbers wise and how the last couple of years have gone, I think it could have been a lot better if I would have, you know, gotten those questions and those doubts out earlier than I have. But any athlete must go through that at some level, right? I hope so. I, I hope I'm think. not the only one. Uh, I definitely know I'm not the only one. Um, but I think maybe a lot of a lot of times those guys that have those thoughts are the, you know, the the ATs of the world, the Perdomos of the world, the 21, 22 year old kids that, you know, just get called up and you're in a locker room with not only big leaguers, but you're in a locker room with with grown men, you know, 35 year olds, 36 year olds. Yeah. You know, Ian Kennedy's of the world has seven kids. <laughs> you know, and you're 22. I think those thoughts are a little bit more normal than maybe the ones that I had coming in at 30. But like I said, coming back from Korea. It's just a whole different world. You know, obviously people talk about the bright lights of the big leagues. People talk about the extracurricular things that come along with the big leagues, not only with family, fans, you know, access that we have now. Um, I think all of that played a part in it. Do guys that go overseas, because it's more and more common now, the guys that take that path that you had and then come back, do you have a kinship with those guys? I would say I probably have a closer kinship with the guys that I personally played against over there mm -hmm. that came back at the same time like uh, Josh Lindblom comes to mind yeah. uh, Brooks Raley for Tampa comes to mind um, you know Eric Thames when he was here those guys that I got to know pretty well personally over there and then have us all come back and be in the big leagues at the same time uh, I would say I probably hold us a more special place for those guys than uh, than the guys that I don't know I'm happy for those guys that come back, you know, like the Chris Flexens went over yeah. for a year, signed a big league deal. I, I would like to think that I, I played a part in that because um, when I went to Korea, I was, I believe I was the youngest guy to ever go over there at 26. And for me to come back and do the things that I've done, I'm happy that I could have, if I did have an impact on it, I'm happy that I had an impact on guys maybe changing the stigma of what Korea was to what it is now. Now, I remember too, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember hearing some interviews with you where you talked about you were on the honeymoon when you heard the deal or you were getting married? Yeah, I signed the deal. Am I way off on that? No, not quite. We, I actually ended up signing and agreeing to the deal. I can't remember if I signed it or agreed to it, but we ended up agreeing to the deal the morning of my wedding. So we got, we got married December 1st and I, and I knew, so all in one day I got married and knew that I was going to be a big leaguer all on, on one day. So That's it was, a big day. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty big Did day. you have to rewrite the vows after that? <laughs> Wow, that's great. That's, yeah. So that's a lot to process. Yeah. yeah was, I mean, when you have a life change, you have a life change. Yeah, I, I go big or go home, I guess. Right? Yeah. New I continents, guess. new leagues. Yeah, new countries, new experiences. But, I mean, sitting here talking to you today, I wouldn't change any of it. So I want to go to 2020 now, which was a super fun year for everybody. <laughs> you survived those last six weeks at 19. Okay, I can do this. I'm no longer the worst pitcher in baseball. Nobody's yelling at me. And all of a sudden they're taking body parts out of you. Yeah. After a tremendous start to that season, your yeah. first three or five, five. starts, five, five starts, yeah. the numbers were sensational. And then all of a sudden, no. Yeah, and all of a sudden my arm is what happened? 10 pounds heavier and a different color. Yeah, the old blood clot. Yeah, so it started with a clot in the shoulder. That was one procedure, yep. right? And then the thoracic outlet. Yeah. So which was, they were I, within a month of each other or so, maybe? Yeah. So we got the ultrasound, found out we had the clot, was in the hospital that day, slept overnight. Uh, I want to say the surgery was probably about two weeks later, two or three weeks later. Okay. Yeah. So what was happening prior to the blood clot surgery? What was happening with you physically? So I, I first realized it, or I first noticed something was weird. I was doing some scouting in San Diego. We were at the Omni Hotel, sitting there at the desk, um, looking at San Diego's hitters. I was writing some notes, um, happened to look down at my hand and notice that it was a little bit more flush than it usually is. Uh, a little redness tint to just the hand at this moment. Um, so 
didn't really think anything of it. Came in, asked some of the trainers, hey, what do you got on this? They assured me that if anything, redness is a good sign because that means there's blood. You know, I, they said if anything, they would be a little bit more alarmed if it was white because that would mean that there's not the circulation getting to it. So continued on, didn't think anything of it, and slowly that color and that feeling just started creeping up my arm. That's scary. Yeah, and especially at the time, had no clue of what it was. So long story short, fast forward, you know, I was pitching the whole time, flying the whole time, um, getting treatment on it. Uh, I was, by the end of it, I was wearing my compression sleeve pretty much 24 hours a day because that was the only thing that made it feel better. And uh, at some point you have to be thinking, okay, we got to, whatever this is, we got to figure it out and get it fixed. Right? Yeah. So when I had my sleeve on, it felt good. It felt better. When I took my sleeve off, um, from what I learned, that was when all the blood would go back in. And from what I learned, the vein that the clot was in is responsible for flushing the blood out of your arm. So the blood is, your body's smart, it's going to find a way to get the blood into your arm, but it couldn't get back out. Gotcha. So that's where the discoloration was coming from, and that's where the, the sludge is. I described it as sludginess. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to sit there and do this all day because it felt good once I did that. And then when I put it back down, all the blood would go back in. So I threw a game in... Oakland? Yeah, my last game I think was in Oakland. Yeah. We went to San Fran and I was on... So there's two types of TOS. There's neurogenic TOS and there's vascular TOS. Neurogenic is when... TOS, thoracic outlet surgery. Yes, uh, syndrome. syndrome, thoracic outlet syndrome. So originally we thought it was the neurogenic and that's when the nerves up here get inflamed um, and there's sometimes they get tangled up and it's kind of a real mess. Um, what I had is the vascular version of TOS, which is the pinching. What happened is the vein that runs through here, that rib, when I would throw overhand, it would get pinched. And the more it got pinched, the more it would become inflamed, scar tissue would build up, and then that's where the clot started to develop. So I was on day nine of, or day seven out of nine of prednisone, because we thought it was just inflammation, and it just kept getting worse. I threw a bullpen in San Fran. It felt weird, but not enough to, you know, kind of shut things down at the time. Because with the knowledge that we were going off of, you know, I wasn't any risk of actual danger from what we thought. So we get home, I'm supposed to start against Colorado here. And one of the reasons I wasn't concerned leading up to this point is because when I would get warm and the blood would start flowing, my arm would feel better. Yeah. And I would pitch the game and it would be okay. But that day started warming up and it just blew up. Uh, it, was, it was purple, completely different color from this arm. My bicep was probably twice as big as this one. So I, I, at that point I went into Tori's office and said, hey, like, this isn't gonna work. Like, we, we gotta figure out what's going on because there's something going on that's not right. And in the shower that night, I clearly remember trying to wash my hair and I couldn't even, my arm was so heavy, I could barely even get it up to wash my hair there was so much blood that had been pooling. Not because it. of soreness, just because of the weight? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I have pictures of it. Like, like I said, my arm was a completely different color. So that next day, go in for the, the ultrasound, found out that there was a pretty substantial blood clot. Um, so by f I think we got the ultrasound at maybe noon. By 4.30, I was in the hospital with a catheter run up there, uh, dripping, I'm guessing, what was blood thinner of some sort to kind of disintegrate it, to dissolve it is the word I'm looking for. Slept overnight in the hospital. The next morning they came in, took another ultrasound, said, okay, it's about 70% gone. So if there's two options, one, we can either drip you some more and just have it dissolved, or we can just go in and suck the rest out. And at that point, I wanted nothing to do with it anymore. So I said, just go get it. So I got back on the operating table and they went in and, and got it. I went home and then, like I said, two weeks later, I got a rib taken out. And they gave you the rib, I heard you say. Yeah, they, right? they, when put you were it in a, yeah, they put it in a little jar with some, I don't know, it looked like water, but I'm sure it wasn't water. I'm sure it was some sort of solution that they put it in. Um, and as I'm walking out of the, of the hospital room in Dallas, you know, it's just sitting right there on the counter. Um, <laughs> and I stopped and I looked at it and, cause people had asked me if I was gonna take it home, right? And I, I looked at it and thought about it for a second. And A, I didn't know what I would do with it. <laughs> first of all, and B, <laughs> when I looked at it that last time, I said, you know what, like, I want to leave everything that is involved with what I just went through over the past couple months, 
I want to leave all of that behind. So I took it and just dropped it right in the trash can and walked out the door and left know, the little fellow behind and moved on. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. It was not something that I wanted to bring with me. Everything You've had a lot going on in four <laughs> years. I mean, it's, yeah. that's a pretty impressive list of life events. Yeah. But I, you know, I would imagine everybody else also has some pretty crazy life events and, and over the course of four years, you probably just don't hear about them as much just because, you know, we're not, they're probably not in the spotlight like, like we are. So I think our stories probably get a little bit exaggerated, not exaggerated, but, you know, probably a little hyped up more than most people. But yeah. at the end of the day, it was, I think it was a good experience too, because at the end of the day, it just reminds you that we're all human. You know, like what we do is awesome. What we do is great. You know, what we do is special. But when I leave here, you know, I bleed just like you do. I, I have health problems just like everybody else. You so, just have one less rib, that's all. Yeah, I just have one less rib than most people. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Yeah, appreciate it. I appreciate it. Your yeah. hand is no longer purple. It's <laughs> no, it's, it's good. It's good.